presentation. It's being sponsored by the Green Greer Historical Society, which is located in South Sterling. And uh, because of the pandemic, we contacted Allison Tews, who's the uh, program uh, coordinator for the park, to see if we could have programs here this summer outside rather than holding them in our hall, which is a bit confined. And she graciously allowed us to do that. So this is the first of four programs we will have at the park. And um, I think I gave everyone a brochure with our calendar of events. So if you are here uh, for any of our future programs, we'll have one in June, July, and August. And all of those themes um, will, be, will center on uh, the original people of the Poconos, the Native Americans. So different aspects of that uh, topic. And so I don't want to take any more uh, time away from Gene Schultz and his uh, group from uh, Trout Unlimited. Gene is a retired uh, biology high school teacher from Walden Pawpack Area High School. And he's uh, very involved with Lackawack Sanctuary and um, I'm sure a number of other things which you can talk about. But we're, we're glad that he could spend some time with us this afternoon to talk about fly fishing. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Uh, again, I'm Gene and we're here from Pike Lane Trout Unlimited, which is our, our local regional chapter of that. Paul Ranello is our president. So Paul's going to talk briefly about what Pike Wayne Trout Unlimited does. Okay. Uh, Pike Wayne, uh, our, our mission is to ensure cold, clean water in the Poconos and Pike and Wayne County. Uh, we're very fortunate to live in this area of the state. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there's over 16,000 streams, but only 2% of those streams are high quality or exceptional quality streams. Here in Wayne and Pike and Monroe County, we have 80% of the, that 2% that's yeah. extremely clean, drinkable, fishable water. And our goal is to keep it that way. Okay. Uh, we have meetings every month, second Tuesday uh, of, of the month, we meet at 5 o'clock during the summer months, we meet on the towpath on the Lackawaxen River. Uh, we just finished our third stocking of the river uh, last week. It, it's full of young, fresh trout. Uh, we have an agreement with uh, uh, Walton Wallpack, uh, uh, pp &L, that on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, they would not release water to the river to allow people to come in to go fly fishing. During the week, they run their generators, and the river flow is extremely high, and it's very dangerous. Gene's uh, going to talk about fly fishing. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to tell you is if you want to try fly fishing, um, go to Cortman company, uh, buy yourself a, this is an L.L. Bean, <coughs> this is a six foot, I'm sorry, it's an eight foot, six weight rod, uh, it was 55 ounces, rod and reel. Now when you go out and buy a rod and reels, you can go out and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on a rod, don't do that. Buy yourself a decent rod and reel, go out, practice. There's no sense going out and spending money on five, six hundred dollar fishing rod. Or I'll tell you a story. I was down in Florida a couple of years ago, and I we went to a flea market, and the guy had a rod and reel out there, and they said, "Well, how much is it?" And he goes, five bucks." So I picked up the five bucks. I bring it home. I take it to a place, and the guy takes a look at it and goes, "You want to sell it?" I said, "What do you mean sell it?" He goes, "I'll give you twelve hundred dollars for that right now." <laughs> you don't know. So we go to garage sales, people are retiring all the time, you pick up an inexpensive rod and reel, see if you like it. Okay. Also with this is Marina Swartwood. Marina collects vintage fly reels and rods, but she also is in charge of our regional casting for recovery program, and that's a great program. Marina, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, a lot of people are and yes, we do have women fly fishing. And this is a prime example. Matter of fact, two years ago, we had an introduction to women to fly fishing. 
uh, and Moreno was instrumental in that. Uh, but last year, because of COVID, we couldn't have it again. But perhaps this year, once things settle down and there was a lot to come out without a mask on, uh, we'll have another demonstration for introduction to fly fishing for women. But we're not. Okay, I'm glad that they gave me an opportunity to talk about uh, Casting for Recovery. It's a wonderful program. It's for women who are recovering from breast cancer, and we've been around since 1996. And the program is for women who are recovering from breast cancer, whether they're six months out of treatment or 20, 30 years out of it. And what they do is they have an opportunity to go to a retreat. We have one here at Sky Talk Retreat. And they go away for two, one and a half days. We teach them how to fly fish. Uh, they get to eat like crazy. The food there, if anybody's been there, is amazing. There are usually around 14 or 16 other women that are going through basically the same things that they've had. Uh, they learn about new pro programs that are out there, new uh, medications that are out there, what to do, what not to do. And at the end of it, after we've taught them how to fly fish for those days, and we teach them everything, it's a quick little course, we give them their own gillies, their own fishing guide, and they get to go into the stream, they get to catch fish, they have an amazing time. We have a little uh, luncheon afterwards, and for all of that, they pay absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. we, we raise the funds all by ourselves, it's a terrific program. It's in almost every state, also in Europe, in Australia. So we're all over the place. So I'm always here talking it, talking it up, letting everybody know it's out there. So. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. <laughs> so I put together a little presentation just on what fly fishing is and the history of fly fishing. You know globally, so and then we're going to eventually concentrate on a little bit of history here in the Poconos. So up here, this is a, a typical dry fly that's meant to float on the water. That's an, it's called, all these flies have names, and this is called an Adams. It's a classic dry fly. If you don't know what else to put on, throw one of those on. Typically works. Part of the fun of fly fishing is the craft that goes with it. Tying the flies and putting them together like that is a lot of fun. My dad taught me to do this, so I've been doing it since I was 10 or 11 years old. So that's part of the fun, even to the point of building fly rods from scratch and just learning to do that and getting better. There are people who are much better at all of this than I am, but it's part of the fun of, of the sport. And there's just, a, I do occasionally catch a nice fish. That's just <laughs> proof. <laughs> so have you ever? driven by a stream or a lake and seen somebody standing out there doing that and wondering, what are they doing? Well, you know, before I started, I thought the purpose was fly fishing. They were making that fly fly through the air and the trout were looking up at that thinking that's a live thing and that's what they were doing. Well, I learned that's not what they're doing at all. See, when you fish regularly with a regular spinning rod or something like that, the weight is in the lure. So the weight is what carries the line out when you throw that cast. In fly fishing, now there's a, that's a, hooks are identified by size. This is a size 16, very small, weighs virtually nothing. So throwing that with a typical spinning rod would not work because there's no weight there. So the purpose of doing that, the weight is in the line. So what happens then is they're using the weight of the line to get the bait out to the fish. And that's, the, that's actually what they're doing, is using that technique. And we'll go out in the, the grass later and do some of that. Well, we fly fish for trout. You can fly fish for a lot of other species. You can fly fish for just about any of the other fish that are out there. But this is my favorite, and that's what mostly lives around here in our streams. These pictures came from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission website. That's a great website. Lots of really good educational material in there. This is the only trout that is native to Pennsylvania. Anybody know what it is? Uh, brook trout. That's brook trout. Yep. Yeah. That's a brook trout. It's a wild. It's a native brook trout. They're beautiful. If you ever find a stream that is full of native brook trout, the stream can be as wide as this table, and they live in these little pockets. And sometimes they're only that big. 
And my sister said to me once, what are you, catching bait? No, I'm catching these little beautiful gems of fish that are just so brightly colored and beautiful. And so that's the fish that is native to Pennsylvania. That is a brown trout. Brown trout have been introduced to Pennsylvania. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the history and the stocking and how they've been brought here. They were brought here in the late 1800s and a couple of different varieties of them. This is a rainbow trout. Brown trout, by the way, came from Europe. They came from Germany. Rainbow trout came from the western United States. They've also been introduced here. They are not native here. So that's their story. And then finally, there's this genetic freak of nature that everybody seems to want to catch and put their pictures on Facebook and all over the place. They used to be called in the 70s, when they first were introduced, they were called palominos because they're yellow and off color like that. There is now a new genetic strain out there that came from a golden rainbow trout mutant out of West Virginia that has been bred through the line. So that is now referred to as a golden rainbow trout. So notice the, the rainbow stripe that closely matches what's on, what's on the rainbow. Okay. So how do we fly fish? Well, you do need to know a little bit about insect biology. and that. I have to tell you, I probably went to college to study biology and became a biology teacher because of my dad teaching me this kind of thing. I love to be outdoors and I love studying the insects and all of that. But these insects that are aquatic and the fish feed on go through the typical insect metamorphosis, much like a butterfly does. So they start as an egg down in the water under the stones. They hatch into a purely aquatic stage that we call a nymph. And they have these little breathing gills back on their abdomen that beat and collect the oxygen out of the water. And they'll live like that, well, for up to a year in most cases under the water. And fish love to eat those. So if you hear of someone nymphing or fishing with a nymph, they're using a fly that imitates that, that sinks down in the water and bounces along the bottom and tries to trick the fish into thinking that that's the real thing. So there, you're welcome to look at all these later. There's a, a box full of nymphs that are, that are sitting up here. You're welcome to take a look at those. Once a year, at certain times of the year, those nymphs hatch out. And the idea is to match the hatch. So what happens is they hatch out all at once the same species over a period of a few days and it's based on temperature and sunlight and that kind of thing, much like it is with a lot of the other insects. They'll hatch out and if you time it right, you happen to be there at the stream when they are hatching. It's just an incredible sight. My wife hates it. She won't go stand there with me because you're surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of these insects. But if you're fly fishing and standing on a stream, it's a thing of beauty to actually to, to watch because the, these, what they'll do is they'll hatch out of the nymph stage and swim up through the water onto the surface. And at that point, if you think the fish are feeding on these emerging insects, you fish with an emerger. And you cast that out there and you let that sink a little bit and you fish with that underwater and it's supposed to imitate that insect coming up through the water. But the best part of this is when you can fish dry flies. I, I will skip all of those others and force myself to fish a dry fly, even if they're not biting on them, just because it's so much more fun. Dry flies float on the water. These are now the hatched adults. This is a mayfly. They don't bite. As a matter of fact, their scientific order that they belong to is called Ephemeroptera, and translated from Latin, that means wing for a day. They live as an adult for one day. They don't even have feeding mouth parts. They, they come out onto the surface of the water, they float for a while, the fish doesn't come up and eat them, they fly away off into the trees and grass and, and shrub, and they'll mate. There are separate males and females, they'll mate. The females will come back onto the water, lay their eggs, and sometimes when they fall down onto the water, the fish will also eat them. So what's so much fun about that is you can actually watch the fish feeding. The, the fish will rise up and create these, these rings on the surface. And then the, the trick is to get that dry fly to float like it's a natural insect 
you know, the fish have these tiny, tiny brains, but they quite often outsmart me because they're zoned in on what is food and what isn't food. So if that insect is not floating just right like the others are, they won't touch it. So they know that. And that's the trick of a fly fisherman, is to get that fly to float down past that fish without any drag on it from the line. So that's how you match the hatch, and that's what fly fishermen are attempting to do. There are scores of different insects that hatch out throughout the year. So there are charts that diagram all of this for us so that we can attempt to predict what's there. I have this habit of carrying everything with me, which is why my desk probably weighs pounds. And just to be prepared for whatever is, at, is going to hatch at the time, try to, try to match the color and the size and that kind of thing. Other common insects that fish will eat, this is a stonefly. They hatch into a, and you, you've probably seen some of these around. This is a little yellow stonefly. Their wings are flat on their back like that instead of upright like they are in mayfly. This is a caddisfly. Caddisflies are cool because when they're nymphs in the water, they create a lot of them, not all. They create these little cases that they live in. Some, they, they chew up leaves, their little twigs, and they surround themselves with it. Sometimes it, it's little stones. I've even seen that where someone has made jewelry out of these cases. They'll put gold particles or shiny particles in the water with these caddis larvae and they'll make the case into, into jewelry. As an adult, it looks somewhat like a moth tent-like wings over the back, that's a caddis. This is a halbermite. Halbermites are also known as dobson flies. They hatch into these really big insects that, uh, that hatch out all like that at once. You can also imitate bait fish when you're fly fishing by using streamers. This is a, a black-nosed dace, and that's one of its imitations. So you fish those, and you fish it very much like you do you try to imitate the minnow swimming through the water and, and get the fish to bite on that. So tackle, how do you do this? Well, you use a rod and a reel and a line and a leader. So this is, we'll talk about the different kinds of rods in a little while, but this is a, a typical fly fishing outfit. This is a nine foot, five weight rod. The weight refers to the diameter and weight of, not this monofilament, but the line behind it. So that's a five weight line that's made out of plastic polymers that floats. So that's designed to float. You occasionally have to dress it and clean it and put a, a treatment on it that helps it float. So that's the line, and that's what gives the weight for casting that fly out there. The weights start low with, I'm not sure they make a one weight, but they make two weights, which is extremely light. This is a two-weight rod. This is a six-foot two-weight rod that I use in those little streams to catch those little brook trout. Very small. Um, doesn't have a, a lot of flex to it. And they can go all the way up to 10 weights and, and more, I guess. 15. 15. Then they, uh, they use for steelhead and things like that up on, up on the, the tributaries of Erie and Ontario and that kind of thing. So that's the line. Attached to the end of the line that you attach the fly to is a leader. This is monofilament, much like regular fishing line, except this is not straight, flat line. This is tapered. When those people are out there doing that cast, the idea is to transfer the energy from the heavy line out to the fly. So this has, attached at the fly line, a heavier monofilament, and it tapers down to a really, really thin section of monofilament at the end that you tie the fly to. And hopefully the fish don't see that. If they do see it, they don't pay any attention to it. Reels come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes and expenses. Quite often, for fishing small trout streams, the fishermen will tell you the reel is only there to hold the line. You, you seldom play a fish with a fly reel unless it's a really big fish or you're on big water. Quite often, on smaller waters, fishermen will play the fish with their hand. They'll, they'll control the line and 
bring in fish that way and let it out when it pools and that kind of thing. Some of the reels have a drag on them, much like the other spinning reels and things like that do to fight the fish if it's taking off on you. So that's a, a basics on equipment. So how do you catch fish? Let's see if this works. Short move. The minute you see a fish rise. I know it's hard to resist, but you'll be less frustrated and have more fun if you hold off. See all these spot rising fish. Water, first observe fish up. and make a plan before you make a cast. Watch the fish rising for a while. Fish could be cruising in a slower pool instead of staying in one position. Or there may be more than one fish rising, and a quick glance at the water may not betray that second fish. The worst thing you can do is throw your fly line on top of a fish, so make sure there is not a second fish rising between you and your target, or make sure the fish you see rising is not moving. Okay, he's facing to the right of that. Uh, he's facing to the right of There's that. There's two fish. Oh, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. That's a throw. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is a lot of fun. That was awesome, man. That was cool. Okay, so that's how you catch a fish with a dry fly. Watch for fish to rise, and you attempt to target them by casting above them and letting that fly float down with the rest. And hopefully, your fly looks real enough that that fish wants to eat that. Uh, it's my opinion that quite often these don't these look somewhat like real insects, but it, this is just my opinion, and there are people out there that will back this that since they don't perfectly insect imitate the insect that's floating, they look like a cripple. So they look like a crippled insect that didn't quite make it all the way out of the hatching process, and fish will zone in on those. So I keep thinking that my lousy tide flies catch fish because they look like they're imperfect. So, any questions so far? Let's do a little bit about history. The history of fly fishing followed civilization, and there are records back to the first and second centuries in Roman Macedonia of fly fishing. Back in those days, they did not do it for leisure. They did it for food. They had to, you know, we do this for fun because we have so much leisure time now. You know, back then, they, they used it, you know, to eat, to eat. So I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce either of those names because I won't do it right. But there are written records by those two men of tying red wool or materials onto a hook and using it to to catch fish. So there are there are actually written records back to that time. And again it followed civilization. <clears throat> it actually came into its own fly fishing in Europe. Isaac Walton is a very famous name in our history. He wrote a book called The Complete Angler in 1653. You can still find copies of that, where he described fishing in England, I think. Yes, yes fishing in England at that time. In Japan, they do a form of fly fishing called tenkara. That is, a, rods that are longer than these without a reel. They just use long lines attached to the end of that rod. And they have special flies that they use called tenkara flies that do not look like this. They're, they're a different kind of fly. And they still do that in Japan, and it's becoming popular in the U.S. There are, there are tenkara fishermen that will fish in the United States just with those. And if you go into catalogs, you can find tenkara rods and lines and, and flies and things like that. And as we came to the United States and settled in the New World, fly fishing started here. Again, out of necessity, mostly because they would use it to catch food. So we're going to zone in on the Catskills and Poconos. This is the best map I could find of the Catskills and Poconos that, that I could share with you. We are obviously in the Appalachian Mountains, and the Catskills here are symbolized by the sea. The Catskills are across the New York border, right? You're familiar with that. And then, of course, we're here, we're here in the Poconos. The Catskills have become known as the birthplace of fly fishing in the United States. I watched a presentation this winter. The Broadhead chapter of Trout Unlimited was doing some of their meetings on Zoom and Google Meets and things like that. And Don Baylor is a man down there who knows about the, the history in, in the Catskills and the Poconos. So I watched the presentation by him. So some of this is, is his information that I'm relaying along. 
But the Catskills, again, have become known as the birthplace. Famous street names over there are the Willowemock, the Beaverkill, the Never Sink, and the Delaware. The Upper Delaware is probably one of the best trout fisheries in the United States. As a matter of fact, it's become very crowded, and it's hard to, to find places to fish where there aren't, where it's not crowded. And the reason that it's maintained a trout fishery there is because trout need cold water. And Paul talked about how one of the purposes of Trout Unlimited is to preserve that cold water. When water temperatures start to rise above 70 degrees, trout become sick and they can actually die. You know, they start to get around 78 degrees and the fish are dead. They're just not going to live above that temperature. So the beauty of the Lackawaxen River is it's a tailwater from Lake Wampapak. Lake Wan Potpack releases its water from the bottom, it's cold, and maintains the trout fishery down in the Lackawaxin. Same on the Upper Delaware. At the extreme north end of the Upper Delaware are New York City's drinking water reservoirs. And they, really, they also do bottom releases, which is cold, and that keeps that Upper Delaware River cold. So it has become one of the premier wild trout fisheries where the trout are actually reproducing in there. Um, so, again, over in the Catskills, although you can fish it from the Pennsylvania side. Famous names in the Catskills, Theodore Gordon and Art and Joan Wolf. Theodore Gordon was, was one of the, again, premier fly fishermen. He was actually born in the Poconos, but migrated over to the Catskills. So we're going we're gonna to claim him here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> but there are a lot of flies named after Gordon. There's Quill Gordon. He, he was very big at designing and tying a lot of the original flies. Art and Joan Wolf were famous people over. I think Joan is still alive is. and still does. Um, I'm not sure how old she is. She's pretty old by now. Art and Joan Wolf were also teachers and would travel around and do teaching. And Joan still does teaching. This is worth a trip for you sometime if, if you're interested as a, as a society. Livingston Manor over in New York, near Roscoe, is the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum full of all kinds of great tackle and information. And it's, it's either individually as a group, it's worth a stop over there. And it's near the town of Roscoe, which has become known as Trout Town. They've named themselves Trout Town USA. So again, fun trip over to the Catskills. Lots of great restaurants and breweries and things like that over there too. So Roscoe Brewery names all of its brews after fishing things. <laughs> it's fun. Let's come into Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has the highest stream density in the United States. This is a map, this is a stream map of Pennsylvania. And if, I don't know if you can see it very well from back there. This, was, this map was originally put together by a man named Horace Higby back in the 1920s or 30s. And went out of print for a while. I have a copy, my grandfather had one. And I have a copy of that sitting in a closet at home. <coughs> When I went to college, I was so into this, this was one of the posters in my dorm room. <laughs> of course, yeah, well, that's a different time. Uh, they've now reprinted it, and you can buy reprints of this. And I used to have one of those in my classroom and things like that. But there are lots of blue lines on there. And it delineates all the different watersheds. The, to me, the best part is finding the thinnest blue lines on maps and going to see if there are brook trout in there. And that's, it's become known as blue lining. You find, take a topographic map, find a little blue line, see if you can drive and hike to it, and see if there are brook trout living in there. The first time you catch a brook trout out of one of those, it's like, yeah, it, it just it makes your day. So in the Poconos, if the Catskills were known as the birthplace, Don Baylor said that we are the cradle of American fly fishing. Up through the 1800s, all of these streams were full of hundreds and hundreds of brook trout that were reproducing in there. Well, they gathered them for food. They didn't just fly fish for them. They would net them and, and take them and they used them for food. They would smoke them, they would dry them, they would preserve them so they had fish through, through the winter. And there are, there are recordings of anywhere from 15 to 50 fish per day through the 1800s. We were also at that time devastating the environment. We are cutting down all the hemlock trees. All of these little streams are surrounded by hemlocks. And hemlocks provide shade to keep that water cool. 
Well, I'm sure you know that hemlock bark was used for the tannins and it was used in the tanning industry. So they didn't understand that they were destroying brook trout habitat. So by the 1890s, most of those fish were gone. And stocking began of all of those trout. We brought those brown trout in from Germany because they were hardy. The rainbow trout came from the western United States. There are stories of stocking those fish in milk cans. They would carry them on milk cans full of water and use trains to transport them. And the trains would stop and they would stock those fish out of those, out of those train cars with the milk cans. Down in the Poconos, a couple of famous creeks are the Broadhead Creek and Paradise Creek. I'm sure you've driven by them. I don't remember the route numbers, but Broadhead Creek is the, the big creek. 447. Okay. Broadhead Creek is the one that follows 447. Very famous trout stream in the United States. There are books written about it, and all of these famous people that are writing these books now talk about the Broadhead Creek. Paradise Creek is the one that's there on uh, 191. 191. <laughs> <laughs> he goes down. <laughs> still good trout streams and they all have little tributaries to them that also hold fish. The original fly fishing resort was the Henryville House. It is no longer there. I think it was there until just maybe 15 or 20 years ago. The Henryville House was formed in the 1880s and it was a place where presidents and famous people and wealthy people from New York City and Philadelphia came stay and to fish in our Pocono streams. Antelomic is still a town down there that the Broadhead flows through there. And there are a couple of, if you drive through there, you can see what were, a couple of those buildings were inns and bars and hotels. And that's where the fly fishermen hung out. There are books written with them hanging out in there. And then of course in the 1930s, Buck Hill Inn and Sky Top, know we're, we're developed and they're still fishing resorts How about Buck Hill Lake because Buck Hill is closed but you can still go to Sky Top and stay and hire a fishing guide to take you fishing there on, on their property so evolution of equipment well the most vintage that I'm aware of and I'm sure they used other things to fish were bamboo fly rods and these are the, the antiques and Marina collects some of these it's not just a straight piece of bamboo. These craftsmen split the bamboo and then create a hexagon by gluing those split pieces together. You're welcome to take a look at all of this later. This was one, I have three of these that were my great uncles that got passed to me and it's my goal someday. The reason I'm learning to build fly rods is I want to restore these someday. So, and they're made of that split bamboo. There are craftsmen that still make split bamboo rods. So it's quite common to still fish with them, but at one time, that's all they had. And they're, they're great fly rods, they still work. A step up from that, probably sometime around the 40s, 50s and above, we transferred fiberglass. So this is a fiberglass fly rod that was wrapped, the fiberglass was wrapped on a mandrel or a form to create the fly rod. This is the one I first learned on when I was a kid. So ancient, probably. Mm -hmm. And then, Finally, as we develop more and more materials, they're now made of graphite and boron. So this is a graphite with boron fly rod, and you can spend anywhere from 40 or $50 to thousands of dollars on a fly rod. And I, I never understood that, but there are people that do it. And the latest Orvis catalog came early spring to my house, and I flipped through it, and it, it just, it blew my mind that people would pay that much for a fly rod. To me, that, that's a waste. There's, the quality of fishing is not that much better when you pay that much more for a fly rod. I like building my own. It's a lot more fun. I catch fish with the flies I tie and the rods I build. So, so that's the rods. Fly line, when they were using bamboo rods, they did not have these plastic polymers. They actually used silk. They, they made the silk fly line and they would have to occasionally stop and dry it and redress it with probably some of this yeah. mucilin that's sitting yeah. over here. So they would redress that silk fly rod. Now we use plastic polymers. Fly lines also get very expensive and 
I would rather spend the money on a good fly line that's going to float and cast better than on a really expensive rod. The flies range from ones that you can tie that are all natural materials, all feathers, true furs, that kind of thing, to we now have all kinds of artificial components that are designed just for tying flies, all kinds of nylons and other kinds of plastic polymers that are used to do that. So that's mostly what I have. We have a website, pwtu.org, that you're welcome to take a look at. And we also have a Facebook page that I try to keep up to date the best I can, but I've been doing so well. Mm -hmm. So, questions? You were talking about, and you saw the video of the hatch and the gentleman was fishing. I don't get out in the woods that much, but that's not the kind of fishing that I imagine. Why? You've got to wait for the hatch right. to go out and do your fishing. So you can't say, Sunday I'm going out <laughs> on the lack of waxing, I'm going to fish in the summer. You can. Well, you can. Well, I, right. Yeah, but then, that's when you then fish nymphs and wet flies and streamers. I would rather time it quite often these these insects will hatch in the evenings. Mornings and evenings are best. That's why it's known as the evening hatch. So, if, actually, we're giving up evening hatch time right now. This, <laughs> this, is, this is perfect time for, for an insect hatch. You gonna walk out now? <laughs> I don't, yeah. I haven't been fishing a lot this spring, just a little bit. So, let me say something else about our, our chapter. Uh, presently, I have 168 members in our chapter. Um, I have guys that are written about in books. I have guys that don't fish at all. The one thing we have in common is that we're all conservationists. Um, we belong to the Pike County Conservation District. Uh, do you know what the most common pollutant there is in our streams? Humans. <laughs> sediment coming from the roads, yeah. coming from dirt roads, washing its way into the stream. And as the sediment builds up, the, the water becomes more murky and the water becomes warmer. And as James said, if the water gets too warm, the, the fish will die. Or the fish will just move on to someplace where it's cold in water. Okay. Uh, but I want you to know, we have uh, a lot of people that come to our meetings do not fish at all, but they're more interested in conservation or they're interested in teaching youth about fishing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, May 30th is a free fishing day here in the state of Pennsylvania. You do not need a license. I always tell people, grab your grandson, grab your son, take him fishing. Last night I had the opportunity to go on fishing with my oldest son, who turns 30 this year, and he calls me up and says, Dad, let's go fishing. And it was great. We spent four hours fishing, talking, laughing, no phone, just the two of us out. And, and that's what we really got to get back to. It's just getting kids outside, away from their phones, getting into some fresh air. And hopefully, uh, uh, with this COVID ending, we'll be able to get uh, more instruction. Uh, to women, because whether you know it or not, women are the fastest growing segment of fly fishing <coughs> in the country. And fly fishing is very relaxing. It, it's a lot of fun. Like James said, you go out and you catch these little brook trout, and they will give you a fight much stronger than a big stocked trout because it's a native wild fish. If you catch something that's wild, you know you're going to have a, a hard time trying to catch it because it's been out there on its own. Okay. Yes? Are, are you doing your uh, fundraising dinner this year? We were just talking about because of COVID, of course, you know, everything was off, but we're, we're, <laughs> we're looking at doing something in September. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we always like to have that at Uh They're a member of our trout organization. Um, yeah, it would be during the week if we can do it in September, but I, I, I really hope we can get it done. And that was our problem last year, we didn't have any fundraising. Uh, we do a lot of things for the community. Uh, right now we're writing checks to three seniors, 
<coughs> who is a major in some type of uh, uh, studies uh, on the environment. And uh, we, we offer a $500 stipend to each of the schools uh, in, this, in this area. We uh, are going to go up to Lackawack Sanctuary next month. Gene's going to have us come up. And we teach the kids how to fish. A lot of kids don't know how to fish. And we use spinning rods. We don't even use fly rods. We take them out, we get some worms, we take the kids out. And they have a blast. They're catching little sunnies, they're catching this and that. But for a lot of them, it's the first time they've ever had a fly rod or any kind of rod in their hands. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, was Trout Unlimited involved in the uh, stream restoration in the Newfoundland area? Uh, we were. Could you talk about that a little bit? Okay. What they did. Uh, I seem to have a right drift. <laughs> um, it is they, they came in. It was basically put in by uh, uh, PPNL or Brookfield. Uh, uh, and, and what the concept was 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 to place trees. And, and embed the trees into the side of the banks and on either side. And what the, the trees did is it forces the river or the water to move into the center. And as it moves into the center, it moves the sediment with it right out and into the lake. Because what happens, well, again, sediment is the biggest source of pollution that we have in our streams. Uh, uh, so the river was getting wider. Uh, if you noticed it or not, it was getting shallower. So by putting these trees in and, and building this uh, riparian buffer, does anyone know what a riparian buffer is? It's placing bushes, trees, into the, uh, onto the banks of the stream that stabilizes the earth. And it also provides shade for the water. The more shade we have on our water, the cooler the water is. That's why everybody goes down the summer and wants to sit under a tree. The trout want to do the same thing. They want to sit in the shade. Okay. So by doing that, hopefully, we'll improve the water quality, improve the, the flow of the river, uh, uh, and also improve fishing. Okay. Anything else? I'll go back to Al's question. Can you fish at any time? Yeah. Quite often, I would just go stand there and watch. You know, and I'll, I'll look for for fish to start rising and wait for some insects to start hatching. It's just about being outside. And, and the kid, you know, sometimes I'll go in and, and nymph or throw a wet fly or something like that. But I like just being out there. I see some people that go for sunfish, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can smallmouth bass. You know, the, the lack of waxing holds smallmouth bass. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for Lake Mall and Pawpack, the lack of waxing would probably be a smallmouth bass fishery, not a trout fishery. It, the water's too warm. You know, by actually right now in Holly, the water temperature is approaching 70 degrees in the lack of waxing. That's starting to get too warm for trout. It's been hot, so the water is warming more and more quickly, especially as to develop as they develop the upper stretches of lack of waxing. All those paved parking lots create heat, and that water runs off into the into the rivers and it warms them more quickly. So um, yeah. Okay, other questions? Well, you're welcome to take a look at the, the equipment. I think Paul has a knot tying station outside. Marina might do a, a casting demonstration and, and show, go out onto the lawn and show how we do some casting. Okay? Yeah.